My name is Peter Jukes. We're going to have a short film showing some of those dark ads at work and then talk about how we save ourselves, how we combat social media undermining our democracy. Uh, but meanwhile, Carol, I had a quick from the boss, so I can't avoid it. I had one question to ask from Henry Porter. What has happened to those investigations, the NCA and the Met? So about two weeks ago, uh, there we go, about two weeks ago, a question, um, one of the London Assembly members asked a question, Len Duval, and when uh, Cresta Dick was taking questions in there, and she said that we on the, so that, that's the Metropolitan Police investigations, that's about the spending returns. They said that they are looking at weeks, not months, for some news on that. Um, on scoping, they're just doing a scoping exercise. But the thing is about it, I don't think it's going to change anything. And that's yeah. why I sort of, you know, we know they broke the law. The Electoral Commission said that. So it's going to, you know, it looks, it's going to look pretty bad. It already looks pretty bad. So you said you were hopeful. I am hopeful. <laughs> I am hopeful because I think more people are getting this. I think, uh, I, 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 and, and just sort of incrementally, incrementally, I think people are, the, the penny is dropping a bit. Well, before we bring the rest of the panel on, uh, if somebody's up there in the projector room, let's see how people were got at through social media. And here's a short confirmation of some of the dark ads. Maybe you wouldn't have seen here if you were Remainers. Uh, some of the targeting, the micro-targeting would have happened if you're a wavering leave voter. Can we start that short film? Um, an idea. Uh, Sheridan, if you're in the... Thanks for that compilation. Joining us now, if you could sit there, this is Jonathan Sabir, who is an expert from Signify, who will tell us all about social media operations. Paul Hilda, an early digital guru and campaigns expert, and on my right, my beloved, I'm going to be very friendly with him because I so admire this man, Samir Sani. Samir Sani. So obviously, I don't have to introduce you. Mm -hmm. It's now been a year since Carol, with her amazing talents of getting people to come forward and supporting them. Over a year since uh, Shamir's had quite a tough year, but things are getting better. You're more hopeful too? Um, yes, I would say I am. I think the, the work that we all have done, and most of the people here who are speaking today have done, have worked hard to at least inform the public of the level of corruption, the level of how wide and how, imp how important this issue really is. And so, yeah, I'm, I tend to stay hopeful. Well, a lot's down to you, Shamir, coming forward. If we roll back only two months ago, uh, Vote Leave accepted their wrongdoing, having appealed it. Uh, you managed to get a certain organization, nine organizations, not far away in a legal case. Just to update us, we'll get to the dark ads in a moment. Just if people miss this lovely little um, legal moment, you had a legal case against nine organizations. Could you briefly explain on what they had to admit to settle with you? So I, um, obviously when I blew the whistle um, on vote leave, I was... Uh, fired from my position as digital campaign manager for the Taxpayers Alliance right across the road, um, who are situated in a building called 55 Tufton Street. And so in their lawsuit, in my lawsuit against them, 
I sort of made the case that they had fired me unlawfully. I, they conceded on every claim that I made, which is not normal, uh, admitting to firing me because of my belief, and I quote, in the <laughs> sanctity of democracy. <laughs> Shame on you. Uh, they admitted they admitted to coordinating with several other right-wing groups who all have huge platforms within public discourse and mainstream media to coordinating a disinformation campaign against me uh, because of the revelations that I made at Vote Leave. And so, yeah, now I'm just handling the settlement. But So amazing admission on their part. Um, and, you know, one of the things we might have noticed that when we're talking about social media is um, those organizations. I think there's going to be a panel with Mary Fitzgerald, which will talk about dark money. One might think about you know, American dark money and Citizens United. But one thing I think it's worth stressing um, in the year since I first met you, honored to meet you last March, um, it's not just social media, is it? I mean, a lot of the social media gurus you worked with who could be, let's say, involved in some wrongdoing now appear regularly on the BBC. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a mixture of things, right? Social media isn't the only force in play that is allowing for th the rise of populism or the far right. And it's, it's not social media that is perpetuating racist sentiment. It is also the normalizing of, that, um, of these values on mainstream publications and news channels. And I s saw that personally where I wasn't being given the platform to speak to the public about Vote Leave's criminality, yet the people who were involved in the crimes were giving one-on-one -on -one interviews with the leading correspondent in the country. And so there is a responsibility that media organizations have in this entire conundrum to actually not be nonpartisan when it comes to criminals versus like victims. So, I mean, you'd think that was, that, that's, you'd think that'd be obvious, but the sort of conversations going on in mainstream media, not just the mainstream media, even in sort of publications that aren't read by that many people, is that somehow we have to balance crimes <laughs> with the law. And sometimes you have to like balance like murder with the victims. That's not how it <laughs> works. And, and that's, you know, that's what allows for uh, the propagation of Islamophobia, of racism, of transphobia, of mm. um, xenophobia, and all of these sort of extremely disgusting values. There are two sides to the Holocaust. Right. Yeah, well, quite. Uh, just an example of that. Um, I don't know if people remember during the tragic accidental fire in Notre Dame that rapidly, and Russia Today, I think at least Sputnik was involved, a photograph of two suspicious Muslims leaving the blaze was photoshopped and shared on social media. Um, and, you know, RT is a public broadcaster, uh, not a public, a private broadcaster owned by Putin's friend. Jonathan, can I bring you uh, in on this and just some of that micro-targeting? Jonathan spo spotted well before Carol uncovered the truth around that time, the power of Cambridge Analytica. You can see the data floating around. To what extent, just picking up this theme, I've been told, for example, a certain Leave campaign, which now is involved in um, pushing for a certain Brexit party, particularly targeted chairs of constituency associations, of Tory constituencies, where the MP had voted remain or looked to, or maybe was running a DCMS committee. Is it down to that level of granularity? You can actually go, let's swarm this one person with trolls, bots, threats, and, and therefore you're not targeting the population, you may be targeting down to that level. Is that viable? Is that me being stupid? There's, uh, well, yeah, there's certainly been an atomization of how you can conduct campaigns, but with, with great volume. So when you're talking about swarming and targeting people, it's not just the fact that you can target ads to certain groups that will never be seen by others. I think it was very interesting looking at the ads um, uh, in the video just before, um, because there have I had so many conversations since 2016 where you're talking to groups of people, and particularly in London, and if you talk about the kind of ads that were being run, and you know, uh, there were ads run around animal welfare, which is quite surprising, um, the ads about Turkey and the border with, with Syria, et cetera, 
Um, so many people go, but I never saw any of those ads. Mm -hmm. And it's just indicative that you, that because they lived in London and they weren't part of the target audience, they weren't even aware of that campaign that was going on. So you can absolutely go and target. And we've seen various different campaigns um, which have intensified over the, the, one of the key points is that the campaign has never really stopped. After the referendum, the campaign kind of for Brexit never really uh, stopped vote leave, kind of um, wound down. Um, but lots of different campaigns have sprung up since, and the proxy campaigns are really important. Um, and they are running targeted campaigns. The one you suggest, uh, I think I know who you're talking about. Um, but it is possible. But you, with that targeting, you can also... <laughs> so Aaron's calling. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the proliferation. You can bring on top of that, what social media allows you to then do is to, as well as you're targeting to a particular section of the population, whether that's a very small group or, or a broader town, city, constituency, whatever it might be, you can then run open campaigns that bring in a group that supports your ideology or issue. And often we've, we've seen campaigns use uh, threats and kind of really intense... Um, uh, kind of pressure to try and pressure people in that way and what's really interesting about that and what's fundamental to thinking about social media campaigning at the moment is that social media has no borders so when you're thinking about politics there are no national campaigns anymore so when we talked earlier and, and Dominic Greaves said uh, he was subject to death threats called a traitor in the street we've seen particularly female MPs mm -hmm. targeted to a high level of threats you sort of revealed something, you didn't name any campaigns, I'm not going to talk about names, but you can hire these people. Do you think people are hired to do that? There are, we definitely know about organizations that have teams. So when people talk about bots, often you think about kind of automated um, fake accounts being used en masse, but there are also, a, a campaign tactic is to have a dedicated team of people who are just there to generate content on mass scale on one particular issue and just push that out, and they'll be pushing that out from a, a range of different accounts. So it's, yeah, you, you create your own kind of... But down to the level on. of, I'm coming for you, here's your address. I've seen that sometimes. S certainly we've seen threats. Threats have become a legitimate campaign tactic because they do affect the way that people operate because people in the political sphere are just human and they react if they're getting intense threats, if they're under pressure, if they are having to have security and kind of, you know, change the way that they interact, that has an impact on them. Yeah. And there are cases where the people who are organizing that are close enough to the system to understand that that's a legitimate tactic. And be deniable, they can't be traced yeah. and they're anonymous. The other one thing, before I turn to Paul, so maybe some better news, is you said that people forget that it isn't necessarily about turning out the vote. And just bear in mind, there's a 2% swing would have changed the Brexit vote, that's one person in 50 needs to change their mind or not turn out, and you, you said sort of, I think we can mention that, a certain Metis database was publicly acknowledged as a way of suppressing the vote or something, did you say? Well, there is, I mean, we, we talk about kind of uh, data in, in politics, and particularly in UK politics, but if we're nearly a decade of it being genuinely kind of involved. The, if you go back to the AV campaign in 2011, that's the first time that it really, really takes off and it is, is put into use. And around that time, there was a database created um, that was nicknamed Metis by uh, um, a political organization um, made up of different people from different parties. And the last time that they talked about using that database publicly, they talked in 2015, um, using it for David Cameron's campaign to target wavering uh, Labour voters who might be scared off from voting for Ed Miliband. And so, and that's, that data hasn't gone away because it's very useful. Where it is now is a very interesting question. But, it's, but social media campaigns, often you will see they're not campaigning specifically for one party. They're mm. campaigning on an emotive point. And that emotive point can be used for different audiences, either for a positive action or to stop you doing something. You can become so angry that you don't want to engage in a process or you... That's, what the, that's fundamentally what the undermining of trust in politicians is actually doing. It's it's creating an atmosphere where people don't want to engage in the process at all because they think it's rigged. And the fewer numbers you have, um, you have to control to kind of to get 
over the line in terms of what you actually want to achieve in a political sense, the easier that is because you have a much smaller audience who's making the decisions. And, and that can be done at a, America does it extensively, but I was people telling me I needed my passport to vote. Because this yeah. government, you know, and they were. Yeah, yeah. Just, just finally, before I turn to Paul, what, the thing I took away from you and take away what you say is that basically there's no national campaigns anymore from what you're saying. Money can come, this is another panel later, money can come from anywhere. Yeah, so, I mean, social media does not respect borders. And in some cases, that can be interesting and maybe have positive effects. YouTube doesn't technically exist in China, but it's the 12th most visited site in China because people are using VPNs, and so you're able to kind of maybe use that to, to kind of subvert and change the, the media narrative there, and that might be beneficial. Turkey is also another good example where, uh, you know, Turkey is a country that doesn't like journalists and arrest journalists, and YouTube is being used as a platform um, that might be able to, to help correct that balance. But in other cases, it can be really dangerous because... A very quick example, we looked at a campaign um, in Africa where some sexual health clinics had been prevented from providing services, and it was as a result of a social media campaign. Um, and I think this will be mentioned in kind of the, the dark money panel as well. But the impetus for that, the kind of ideological impetus for that came from Europe and the US. The money fundamentally came from the same places. There were movies made to support this campaign in the US that came from kind of a movie producing house that is basically set up to produce ideological movies. That was then given to a, a local person in country who ran a proxy Facebook campaign off the back of that film um, and was able to influence enough people kind of in the country to get these clinics um, prevented from offering their services. But if you're if you're, in a partic if you're in that country and you're just looking at the social media, you think, well, this is a, a, a popular uh, groundswell of opinion in my country. This is what the will of the people, if I use that phrase. But actually, it's not because it's controlled from Europe and the money's coming from America so, and the money's coming. So it's... So will of some oligarchs. Yeah, there are, there are issue campaigns now. There are not national political campaigns. And social media has allowed that to become a reality. So, Paul, you began in a way at the utopian edge, didn't you, of social media, crowd pack, all that kind of sourcing. And you've been through the whole Cambridge Analytica story, so I imagine some of these foreign campaigns are familiar to you. Can I give you a simple question? What went wrong and how do we put it right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if I can give a lateral answer to Good. that. What, what went wrong is oligarchy. Right. Right? So it's, it's actually not the technology that's the problem. In, it's ownership. It's, it's where the power lies, right? Um, there's every, every technology we've ever had has been used for good and for ill. Uh, back in the age of mass communications uh, and the, the origins of advertising, you know, you had Edward de Bernays, the original propagandist, uh, getting all of these young women to light up uh, uh, on this on this freedom march just before the Wall Street crash actually uh, and um, and that was the the origins of linking feminism to uh, to smoking uh, uh, and then the, the Nazis created this thing called the people's receiver uh, which basically locked down broadcasting in Nazi Germany uh, so that you could only listen to their broadcasting uh, and, but then you had somebody like Roosevelt using broadcast for good. So I think that you can use t these networked social technologies for good and for ill, but you need to understand what is the landscape that we're playing on. Uh, and the landscape that we're playing on is oligarchy, it's abuse of power, um, and all sorts of uh, loopholes and uh, vulnerabilities in our democracies. Uh, so I think that we need to work at a sort of a strategic level and think very big about things like breaking up big tech. Uh, I launched the Freedom From Facebook campaign last year after I did some of my investigation stuff on Cambridge Analytica, uh, uh, working with one of the biggest antitrust think tanks in Washington, DC, uh, flying planes over their shareholders meetings, all kinds of fun. Uh, and you are seeing over the last, uh, uh, what, 18 months, uh, thanks to a couple of things. Firstly, the Cambridge Analytica story, which I think has this seismic effect on the public conversation. 
Uh, and secondly, the, the organizing that's taking place around that, a whole series of people in the Democratic uh, primary uh, taking up that idea of breaking up big tech and taking it seriously, even Trump starting to flirt with it and the Republicans. Uh, and, um, you know, because there's a wind blowing, right? So that's one thing. I'd say another thing, you know, Trump's flirting with it, obviously cynical and you wouldn't follow through in a million years. But, um, uh, but then, you know, the next panel is going to talk about the money stuff. I don't want to talk about no. too much about that, but, uh, you know, all of the offshore laundering money into, into the country. What, what about other legislation, like, uh, you know, the idea of GDPR or extended version mm. of data rights? I mean, they're making their money from the data, which is very valuable. You're giving up from yourselves like oil. Oil's more valuable than data, and you're giving it to them free. Is there any way one can deal with that internationally at a sort of rights level, or is that is it the monopolies first? Well, I think I think you attack it from every angle you can. Uh, I think that uh, there is a big question about like what's the new settlement for data uh, because there's a lot of potential public value there. Uh, there are people are playing with ideas of data trusts and actually putting data in the hands of the many, not the few, but then how do you put safeguards around that? Uh, so I, I think that's a big and complicated problem. There are other people saying everybody should just own their own data and be able to sell it. Uh, the trouble with that being it's very kind of uh, Tufton Street idea, <laughs> actually. Um, uh, but um, I mean, look, sort of stepping back and uh, I came into this, as you say, as an idealist who was going and doing uh, network social organizing and building movements and platforms like Avaz and change.org and 38 degrees to try and reconnect people with power and try and renew politics in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and uh, in a way, I feel like the dream got mugged. In a way, I feel like uh, the, the thing that we, those of us who were sort of looking carefully at the world over the last 20, 30 years, uh, particularly outside this country, have always known is, you know, abuse of power is a thing. Like, there were people running influence campaigns uh, with British and American money in Iraq and all around the world. Uh, I went to school with one of them, bloody idiot. But, um, you know, I, 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 and just the nature of these relationships, fucking oligarchy, like, I, let me tell you this story. I, I still can't quite process this story. I went to this Scottish castle. My wife was a journalist. There was some PR thing. Uh, and it was the fucking elite. <laughs> and um, there was this lawyer who'd flown his whole family up from his castle in Dorset. Uh, and I sat next to his business associate from Guernsey, who was his accountant, uh, at dinner. And he started telling me about their offshore wangles. Uh, and... Uh, it later transpired that this guy, his first name St Stephen, was the lead lawyer to the oligarchs, and his helicopter dropped out of the sky a couple of uh, years later. Um, uh, but one of the other guests, there were two, actually two Lib Dems. Uh, there was Lord Thurso, who was a guest at that party, and the other one was Richard Allen, who is now ah, wow. the chief public affairs guy for Facebook in Europe. Um, and it, this stuff is just, it's, it's broken. Just, I, I want to turn back to Cal. But... Sad, sadly, we only have five minutes left, but I have just time to tell you my quick oligarch story, which was a friend of mine met Oleg Deripaska with his dog. And Oleg was stroking the dog, and my friend said, that's a lovely dog. He said, yes, I've got six others cloned from South Korea. <laughs> so he loved that dog. He had it replicated six times, which tells you about oligarch love. You, Carol, one of, one of the things you did was to go into the lion's den. I hope you've all seen this amazing... YouTube, I've never, YouTube, of a TED talk. I've never seen Carol so scared, but so <laughs> brilliant. And she goes into the lion's den with people like Zuckerberg. Does what Paul's slightly talking about is the shame work. Is that one way? Can, you know, you said the moral force. Is that one way? Can we shame and legislate these people to give our democracy back? It's so interesting. I, I think that shame is a real key in this. Because, you know, people have to work for these companies. Facebook has to retain 
its talent. And it's really interesting, because I was told that the, the, the wages in Silicon Valley are going up and up and up, and it's because Facebook is, having to, is distorting the economy. They're having to pay so much more now for engineers to get people to stay. So I, I, and it, it comes down to this thing again, which is a sort of the thing that I was saying, which is that I really... This story is, you know, it, it can seem really complicated. The way I told it, I'm sure it seemed like stupidly complicated. I'm sorry for that. I got a bit carried away. But, the, but the, there is some really, really clear moral lines in it. And, and that is the thing that has managed to have been kind of forgotten and obliterated. And I think you can see that so clearly with Facebook. Facebook, the U United Nations, you know, accused Facebook of aiding um, mass killings in Myanmar. You know, how do you live with that? And they don't, you know, and, and, and I've heard, there's been one interview I've heard where like, Mark Zuckerberg has been really questioned on that. And he can't, he can't bring himself to answer, but we should, that's the question we should all be asking and continuing to ask. And again, with what has happened to our democracy. So the fact that we know Facebook has this evidence about what happened, it has the forensics, it has these answers. It has been asked by Parliament multiple times to give it to us, and they're refusing. And Nick Clegg, Not Nick a great Clegg, <laughs> who was a publicly elected public servant, is now, you know, the handmaiden in that company, who is, you know, passionately pro-European. But he is collaborating with them. I mean, my thing is, Nick, if you're out there... Nick, are you listening? <laughs> if you're out there, Nick, if you're listening and you have the emails, you know, it's that... <laughs> Be a whistleblower. I mean, how much money is enough money? How much money is enough money to take Carol, from these companies? It's brilliant. Whistleblows, Carol. She looks after you. Looks yeah, me we can get you You'll legal advice. After. She'll take you for curry. You've signed an NDA, but you know we can get legal help. Just come over, Nick. Come over. Well, bring the and bring bring the data with you. Bring that. Come back. So. That's one positive thing you can all go and do is shame these people. Maybe shame Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson if they're working together. Maybe there's a bit of shame attached. Maybe the fact that Donald Trump is now saying he wants to gobble up the health service might make Boris feel a but bit it, ashamed. It's, but I think it's so critical that we like, stop calling him Boris. I, sorry. Like, I call him Johnson in my life. It is not Boris. In the paper, we always he, call him Johnson. He is not cute and he is not charming, and we've got to treat him differently. Yeah. And he is, you know, we have to hold him to account, and he is not being held to account. And that's on us. Again, that is on Sh us. To shame do. him and call him Johnson. Shame you, Peter Dukes. <laughs> I, I, say, I put you. Boris Johnson in the paper every day. <laughs> Look, it was the, just reality, the reality is our politics has never uh, looked more messy and more dangerous, and yet there is a lot of hope. I, I think there's a lot of hope in the extent to which we are starting to expose some of the malefactors. I'd encourage everybody, by the way, uh, next month, uh, towards the end of July, there's going to be a film uh, called The Great Hack on Netflix, which Carol's in, I'm in, other people are in, which is about Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, all of that stuff. It's bloody brilliant. So I'd encourage everyone to go Great and look plug. at that. But then there, there is, we, we need hope as well as fear and exposure. We need organizing. And I think that people need to organize at the social level and at the political level. I just came off a bunch of work in the European campaigns all around uh, Europe. And you know, there was a sign projected on the Eiffel Tower that said, no to hate yes to change, uh, which was the slogan for a massive turnout campaign which was run by all these different organizations around Europe. Uh, the Greens did bloody brilliantly, lots of good people did brilliantly, the populists underperformed. So we've got a lot of hope. And big penises. And, and as by donkeys and people like that messaging big penises as you began with for Trump. So thank you everybody. We'll now go move on to the next panel. <laughs>